Good morning, friends. Welcome to our online worship here at Livingston United Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, June the 14th of 2020. Now, earlier this morning, many of our people gathered out at the Wesley again for our outside slash drive-in service. And once again, we had a great time. But but I recognize not everybody feels comfortable or is able to get out and, and do that just yet. So we want to continue to provide our Sunday morning messages for you. But like I said earlier today at, at the service, I, I want to thank you and express my appreciation to you for so faithfully um, continuing to support Livingston United Methodist Church as we seek to do the will of God here in our world today. Now before I open up the word and, and teach, I want to um, I, I want to just pray for, for us this morning. Will you pray? Will you just bow your head and pray with me as we go to the Lord. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the beauty of it. Thank you for Jesus. And thank you that no matter how dark our world seems to be, no matter what is going on, that you are God no matter what. Lord, open up our hearts, um, our minds, Lord, you know the challenges that each of us are facing right now, the challenges in our country, the health challenges, the racial challenges, all of that and more. Lord God, you know what it is. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will move. And Lord, I pray for each person who is listening this morning that, that you make us part of the solution rather than part of the problem. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, earlier today, I, I sent you an, an email out that, that many of you that are on our email list that you may have received, and it not only has this week's discussion questions for this morning's message, but it, it has sermon notes on it, so you might want to get your phone out and, and pull those up as I, um, as I preach this morning and as I teach from God's Word. Now let me ask you a question. Do you ever remember going to those old 3D movies? You know, the kind when you walk in the door that they give you a cheap pair of 3D glasses that you're supposed to wear while you watch the movie. Now, you don't have to wear the 3D glasses in order to, to watch the movie. You can, still, you can still watch it, but the image isn't very clear. The image is kind of grainy, but the moment you put the 3D glasses on, a transformation occurs, and it feels like the image jumps right off the screen and into your lap. You see, glasses make all the difference in how you see. And what is true in the movie theater, in this case, is true in our spiritual lives as well. It's true in the spiritual realm. Because James is telling us that the glasses that we look through will make all the difference in the world. And James is directing us and trying to get us to see the value of wearing Holy Spirit glasses. Now this morning we're going to continue our series from the book of James. We've come to James chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. And I'm going to read all the way through verse 17. Follow along with me or hear the word of God. Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? 
You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Uh, throughout this series, I've, I've kind of referred to, to Je the book of James as being God's gut punch um, to us. Now, let me, um, let me begin, begin by saying this, that James in this passage, he isn't knocking, making money. He's not knocking doing business. He's not knocking making plans. But what James is addressing is the pervasive problem of human pride and arrogance. The kind of pride and arrogance that says, I'm in charge here. I'm the captain of my own ship. I'm going to decide what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, how I'm going to do it, for how long I'm going to do it, and with whom I'm going to do it. See if you can see where that what I just shared kind of plays out in verse 13. I'm going to give you a little running commentary as I read over this again. James says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, when I want, we, with whom I want, we'll go to this or that city where I want, spend a year there, for however long I want, carry on business and make money for the purpose that I want. Do you kind of see the arrogance that is in that that is in that statement from James? Um, you know, for some reason, this guy that James was talking about, he felt that he was in control, but he made a huge error in judgment because he wasn't in control and neither are you and neither am I. And we are not in control for this reason. We are dependent creatures. We are dependent by nature. The things that we want to do are dependent upon other things happening like the airlines being on time, like, um, gosh, our car cranking, um, like the weather, um, you know, or how about this? What we want to do is dependent upon when the authorities say that social distancing is being relaxed and we can go and we can do whatever it is that we want to do. You see, we are dependent by nature, but God, on the other hand, is independent. For him to do what he wants to do, other things do not have to happen. He's God. He's all-powerful. He can do it whether it's rainy or whether it's sunny. He can do it whether the airlines are on time or, or whether, whether the air traffic controllers are on strike. Other things do not have to happen in order for God to do what he wants to do. God is independent. We are dependent. Now the problem that James was addressing here wasn't planning. In fact, in other places in scripture, we are told to make our plans, but what James was addressing was the kind of planning, independent planning, that leads God out of the equation. It's the kind of planning that goes like this. God, this is what I want to do. Bless my plans. And James says that when we approach life like that, we've got it all backwards. We've got it backwards. And so James would say that we need to consult God. Now, why? Now, I mean, you probably go, yeah, of course, I need to consult God. But 
Have you ever thought about why you need to ask for God's opinion when it comes to making plans? Well, James gives us two specific reasons why we need to consult with God. Number one, our human knowledge is limited. Look at verse 14. James asks this, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Now, I think I have an idea what's going to happen tomorrow, but I, I, really, I, I, I really don't know. Do you? Um, I'm reminded of a friend that um, he worked for, a, um, for a, a kind of a mid-sized company, and they were making a bid for a, for a large multi-million dollar contract. And, and if his company got this contract, all the employees, it wasn't a lot of employees, but they were going to receive very healthy raises. And on top of that, at Christmas, they were going to receive a humongous bonus. Now, my friend we began to dig a little bit and, and found out that, that the likelihood of his company gaining this contract was, was really, really high. So he went out and he went to a real estate agent and he put a down payment down on a very, very nice house, much larger, much nicer than any house he ever could have afforded before. And not only was it a really nice house, it was in a very expensive neighborhood. And, and he was so excited about, being able, about, um, about moving into that house. Not long after he made the, the, the down payment, he signed the rest of the contract, the house was his, but unfortunately, as you can probably guess, the contract fell through. There was no raise for the employees. There was um, no humongous Christmas bonus that would be coming their way. In fact, to this day, my friend is living in a really nice house in an expensive neighborhood, but he can't afford any furniture for this nice house that he lives in. And I wonder, what would have happened if he would have consulted God before he asked God to bless his plans? Mm. You see, it caught, God, caught my friend by surprise, but it, it didn't catch God by surprise. So the first reason why James would say that we need to consult with God when we make our plans, as we're making our plans, is because our knowledge is limited. But there's another reason, and James says that our time is limited. Verse 14 continues. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You see, I'm, my, my life here on this planet called Earth is limited. 70 years, 50 years, 60 years, whatever it happens to be, my life is just a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. So what is that? Me. Well, the, I'm 57 years old. The knowledge that I think that I have gained over the last 57 years is nothing compared to the knowledge that God has who has been around since the beginning of time. Let me show you what I mean. How many of you have said something during this season that goes like this? This pandemic is, is different than anything I've ever experienced before. You said something like that or heard somebody, I've said it more times than, than, than I care to, care to admit. And that is true for me, but here's the crux of the issue. It's not true for God. 
Think of it this way. In 1918, there was an influenza pandemic, a flu pandemic. Um, a huge number of people died as a result. I wasn't there. Were you? <laughs> if you're nodding your head, you're a lot older than I, than I thought you were. But God was there. Or how about in the mid-1300s, in the, I think it's 1340, 1350, something like that. Anybody ever heard of a pandemic called the Black Death or the Bubonic Plague where a large percentage of the world's population died? I wasn't there, were you? God was. You see, this pandemic is not God's first rodeo. It's mine, but it's not God's. So God, James says that we need to consult with God when we're making our plans. First of all, our knowledge is limited. Secondly, our time is limited. And another reason is because God has a plan. And God's plan for you is so much bigger, so much better than anything you or I could ever imagine. You know, about a month, five, six weeks ago, whatever, I, I was looking, I was putting my mask on, and I was going and buying um, graduation cards for our graduating seniors, high school, college, um, grad school, just trying to get these graduation cards. And I noticed something, that there was a very, very popular Bible verse that was on many of these graduation cards. Do you know what it is? Some of you know this verse. It comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. And it says this, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. But do you realize what the original context of where that verse came from? You see, I don't believe that it was origin that it was put in scripture for a graduation card. That, that's all good and, and fine. I think it applies at, at that time. I think we can, can um, draw something from that. But that's not where the original context was. If you go back to Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah was speaking and um, prophesying to the people of Israel while they were spending 70 years in Babylonian captivity because of their sin. They were in a place that they didn't want to be. They were in a very, very dark place, but it was in that very dark place that God said, I still have a plan for you. And my plan is to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. And so, so how do you find that plan? Well, James will say, well, ask God. But, but I also think there's a principle that we talked about last week from James chapter 4, verse 8, when James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Mm. So how do you draw near to God? Let me ask you. If you are praying, are you really drawing near to God? If you are listening to what he says through this book, through the word of God, are you really drawing near to God? So how do you draw near to God? You see, if you are a CNE believer, and you are because you're paying attention right now, you know what a CNE Christian is? 
A CNE Christian is one who only shows up to church on Christmas and Easter. If you are a CNE Christian, you probably aren't drawn very near to God. Or how about this? If you are an SMO Christian, you know what an SMO Christian is? That stands for a Sunday morning only Christian. You aren't drawing near to God. Or if you are a 911 Christian, you know what a 911 Christian is? That's the believer who says, okay, God, these are my plans. This is what I've already predetermined I'm going to do. Don't mess with my plans, but stay close enough just in case they don't work out and you can bail me out. So 911, Christian, just in case of emergencies. You see, C and E Christian, an SMO Christian, a 911 Christian, they aren't drawing near to God. Mm. James has a better way. In verse 15. He said, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's God's will. I think Jesus taught us to pray kind of like that, didn't he? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think Jesus himself prayed that way when he hit a knee in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Father, if it's your will, let this cup that I'm about to face pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Mm. If it's the Lord's will. Mm. Now when we pray, thy will be done, that means that we value his will, that we trust his will, that we trust him to the extent that we trust his plans more than our own plans. And how do you gain that kind of trust? By drawing near to God. But when we insist on going our own way, doing our own thing, asking God to bless my plans rather than, God, your, let your will be done in my plans. It's the height of arrogance. The height of arrogance. Verse 16 James says, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, which is leaving God out of the equation. And all such boasting is evil. Let that sink in. Evil. Not just bad, not just unwise. Evil. Playing in to the devil's hands. So what do we do? What do we do? You know, it's been said that God is, this, this life is that I'm living right now, that you're living, that this life is God's gift to us, but what we do with this life is our gift to God. So what do we do? What is God showing you through this passage? Verse 17, James closes by saying this. He expands our typical understanding of what sin is. He says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them not just unwise it's evil it is sin let me leave you 
with a couple of questions to ponder. To talk with your family, with friends. When you make plans, do you consult God? Why or why not? And what would it look like for you to consult God the next time you make plans? Let's pray. Father God, forgive me when I ask you to bless my plans when you weren't in my plans in the first place. Forgive me. Lord, help me to seek your plans, to seek your opinion, to ask you and to buy into your plans because you're much wiser than I am. You've been around a whole lot longer than I'll ever be. Father God, guide me. Guide us to be the people that make you proud. The people that you are proud to say bear your name and are your children. In Christ's name, Amen. Well, my friends, thank you for joining us here at Livingston United Methodist Church for our online worship. Go in peace. Amen.